Did you know that Joseph Smith used a stone in a hat to translate the Book of Mormon? Did you know that? I didn't know that. Nobody, nobody taught me that. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. John DeLynn. Welcome to Understanding Mormonism. Today, we're going to answer the question, why did Joseph Smith use a seer stone to translate the Book of Mormon? Let's get started. If any of you are like me, you were taught that this was the way that Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. That he sat at a table with the plates in front of him, staring at the plates, possibly with the Urim and Thummim or some spectacles at a breastplate attached to his body. It turns out that that's not the way that Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. So how did Joseph Smith translate the Book of Mormon? It turns out that this is the way Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. He would take a stone, put it in a hat, put his face in the hat, and then dictate the text of the Book of Mormon. Just to illustrate, he take a stone, put it in a hat, put his face in the hat, and dictate the text of the Book of Mormon. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Nobody taught me that. So, where did the stone in the hat come from? I do want to refer you to two previous episodes that go a little bit more in depth than we will today. Number one, how did Joseph Smith become a treasure digger? And number two, was Joseph Smith's treasure digging fraudulent? But just to summarize, here are the main points. During Joseph Smith's day, there were legends throughout New England that pirates, conquistadors, or Native Americans had buried hidden treasure in the ground. By the 1820s, treasure digging was a common practice among uneducated, superstitious, and somewhat disreputable people, usually with the motive of getting rich quick. Treasure diggers believed that ghosts or spirits guarded the buried treasure, and that these ghosts or spirits had the power to remove the treasure at will. This was called slippery treasure. Remember that term for later. Next, these groups of treasure diggers usually hired a scryer or a juggler or a peeper or a seer seer to find the buried treasure. The scryer or peeper or juggler or seer seer would often claim to have a magical stone, a stone like this one, a stone that would tell them where to find the buried treasure. And what they would usually do is take the stone, put it in a hat, put their face in the hat and tell people where the buried treasure was. Next, scryers would be hired on for money. They would lead the treasure diggers to a site, have them dig super large holes for multiple days, and then right when they would get to the point of actually finding the buried treasure, the scryers would say, oh no, you didn't touch your elbow right, you didn't kill the chicken right, sorry guys. Remember that ghost and that spirit? The treasure was slippery. The ghost or the spirit took the treasure away. It's gone. Sorry guys, don't forget to pay me. I repeat, two important things here. Number one, the scryers would always get paid. And number two, no treasure was ever found by any scryer, ever. Next point. Inexplicably, the treasure diggers were so superstitious, so gullible, and so desirous to get rich quick that they continued believing that these scryers or peepers or jugglers or seers still had the power to find buried treasure, even though they never found any. And sometimes they were even more motivated to dig in the future after the scryer had failed to find any treasure. Finally, it's important to understand that with these treasure digging expeditions, that scrying was illegal all across New England and in New York and Pennsylvania explicitly. Treasure digging was broadly viewed as a scam scam. So what does any of this have to do with Joseph Smith? I'll tell you. Joseph Smith's treasure digging met literally all of the criteria I just mentioned. Don't believe me? I'll show you. Here we go. Number one, Joseph Smith, his dad, his family, and a bunch of his neighbors and friends were for the most part uneducated, superstitious, and I hate to say it, somewhat disreputable people who all had the motive of getting rich quickly. Joseph Smith Sr. had failed as a farmer time and time again. He had lost multiple farms. His family was super poor and they all needed money, especially after Alvin, the oldest brother, died. Next, Joseph Smith, his family, and many of their friends and neighbors believed that pirates, conquistadors, or Native Americans had buried treasures in the ground around Palmyra and around New England. This was long before Moroni ever allegedly appeared to Joseph Smith. Next point, Joseph Smith, his family, and many of the surrounding neighbors and friends believed that ghosts or spirits guarded the buried treasure and had the power to remove the treasure to make the treasure disappear whenever the angels or spirits wanted to. Remember, that was called slippery treasure. Next, for many, many years, Joseph Smith Jr. was hired to be a scryer or a juggler or a peeper or a seer to help people find buried treasure. He did this 
for years, along with his father, one of the three witnesses, and along with Martin Harris, another one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Next, as a scryer or seer, Joseph Smith claimed to own a magical stone, just like this one, which he claimed had special powers and allowed him to find buried treasure. When he was on a treasure dig, Joseph Smith would take his stone, put it in his hat, put his face in the hat, and tell people where the treasure was. Go over there, Go over there. Come this way, guys. This was all before Joseph Smith ever was visited by Moroni or Nephi. Next, just like we described previously, Joseph Smith's technique was to lead people to a site, have them dig large holes, and then in the last minute, tell them, oh my gosh, guys, you goofed up. We almost made it to the treasure, but you did that thing wrong. You didn't touch your elbow right. You didn't kill the chicken right. The spirit took the treasure away. It's all gone. Dig's over. Sorry, guys, time to move on. And most importantly, Joseph Smith always got paid for his scrying, even though he never found any treasure, not one time, as a scryer or peeper or a seer ever. Next, as we discussed before, many of the treasure diggers who worked with Joseph Smith, including Martin Harris, one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon, continued believing that Joseph had the power to see and even to find buried treasure, even though Joseph Smith never found any treasure. It turns out that for superstitious people, beliefs are super resilient. Next, super important. In 1826, Joseph Smith was tried and convicted of scrying. He was declared to be a public nuisance because everyone knew that treasure digging and scrying was fraudulent. This reality became most painful for Joseph when he was denied his request to marry Emma, his future wife, by his father-in-law, Isaac Hale, because Isaac Hale went on treasure digs with Joseph Smith, saw him perform the scrying, saw him not find any buried treasure, and concluded, like so many other people, that Joseph Smith's treasure digging was fraudulent. Perhaps most stunning of all, Joseph Smith admitted to Isaac Hale, his future father-in-law, while sobbing that his treasure digging was, quote, all damned nonsense. That's what Joseph said. And that in reality, he could never see anything with his peepstone and with his hat. Joseph admitted it. So to conclude, what does any of this have to do with the Book of Mormon? I'll tell you. Modern LDS apologists like Terrell Givens, Richard Bushman, Spencer Fluman, Daniel Peterson try really hard to disconnect Joseph Smith's treasure digging from the Book of Mormon. Or they like to claim that somehow Joseph Smith's treasure digging was simply experimenting with his special powers before he was given the chance to transfer translate the Book of Mormon. What I think the evidence demonstrates is that the Book of Mormon project grew out of Joseph Smith's treasure digging. It was a way for Joseph Smith to convert his scrying skills and his reputation of having special powers into a new money-making project, the Book of Mormon. And most importantly, it became a new legal way to make money to support his burgeoning family. I understand that some of you may not like this explanation, but please allow me to share with you the parallels between the Book of Mormon project and Joseph Smith's treasure digging. Here goes. Number one, the Book of Mormon project included the idea of treasure, the golden plates, buried in a hill, the Hill Cumorah. Number two, the Book of Mormon project included the idea of a spirit, Moroni, guarding the treasure, the golden plates. Number three, the Book of Mormon project included a spirit, Moroni, with the ability to remove the slippery treasure or the plates from Joseph at will. And it's important to note that the golden plates were ultimately withdrawn, just like the buried treasure in the treasure digs, and no credible person ever saw the golden plates. Only those guys that were superstitious, many of whom were treasure diggers with Joseph Smith. Number four, the Hill Camora was a nearby hill where Joseph Smith spent a lot of time digging for buried treasure before, during, and after Moroni's visits with Joseph Smith. Number five, the Book of Mormon project required a scryer or a seer who claimed to have a magical object with special powers, the Urimum Thummim or seer stone to find the buried treasure, just like with the treasure digging. Number six, the Book of Mormon itself discusses treasure digging and even slippery treasure and even the role of a scryer or a seer. It's in the Book of Mormon. Let me read it for you. From Moroni 1.18, insomuch that the inhabitants thereof began to hide up their treasures in the earth and they became slippery. Next, we read 
in Mosiah chapter 8. Here's the coolest part. And the king said that a seer is greater than a prophet. Did you catch that? Seers are greater than prophets. Number seven, the very term seer of prophet, seer, and revelator comes directly from Joseph Smith's treasure digging, along with being in the Bible. But still, number eight, and this one's crazy, the names Camorra and Moroni were commonly associated with treasure digging during Joseph Smith's time. People who read about Captain Kidd loved to treasure dig and would read in the Captain Kidd novels the names Camorra and Moroni. Point number nine. As with the treasure digging, the Book of Mormon project involved a host of gullible and superstitious followers. It's a little bit uncomfortable to acknowledge this, but Joseph Smith Sr., Martin Harris, Oliver Cowdery, all the Whitmer brothers were superstitious, were gullible, and most, if not all of them, were treasure diggers. And they're the Book of Mormon witnesses. Number 10, as with the scrying, there was a very strong financial motive on Joseph Smith's part to write the Book of Mormon. As a newlywed, Joseph desperately needed money, and he knew that he was not going to be a successful farmer. He tried that, didn't work. The Book of Mormon became a new way to make money based on his reputation of having special powers to find hidden things. This is evidenced by the fact that Joseph Smith tried to sell the copyright of the Book of Mormon later on. Number 11, as with treasure digging, the investor in the Book of Mormon, specifically Martin Harris, lost a ton of money. Number 12, we're almost done. As with treasure digging, many of the followers of Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon believed that Joseph Smith had seen golden plates long after the angel or the spirit had withdrawn the slippery treasure or the golden plates from Joseph Smith's possession. People believed more in the golden plates after the angel miraculously took them away. That's where he learned it from the treasure digging. Number 13, the early enemies of Joseph Smith in New York were in two groups. Number one, all the people that thought treasure digging was fraudulent and knew that it was illegal. They were bugged by Joseph Smith's illegal behavior for years. Number two, all of Joseph's fellow treasure diggers who were mad that Joseph was taking off with their golden treasure and not sharing any of the profits with them. They were mad. They wanted a piece of the action. Can you blame them? Finally, number 14, and this is the most important point of all. It's the whole reason we're doing this episode. The very same hat and stone that Joseph Smith used to treasure dig, he used that to translate the Book of Mormon. This means that Joseph Smith did not translate the Book of Mormon by using a Urim and Thummim, like we all were taught until recently. Instead, Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon like that, with the stone and with the hat. To conclude, a few final questions for you to ponder about Joseph Smith, the seer stone, the Book of Mormon, and treasure digging. Question number one. If the Urim and Thummim were available to Joseph Smith, like he claimed, why did Joseph Smith need a peepstone at all? What was the purpose of the Urim and Thummim? Number two. Why would God have Joseph Smith use instruments of admitted fraud for the production of his holiest scripture. It makes no sense. Why would Joseph Smith use instruments of fraud to produce sacred scripture? Number three, why were the plates needed at all if Joseph Smith didn't even use them in the translation process? That's a lot of metal and a lot of smelting and a lot of engraving and a lot of carrying and a lot of digging and a lot of running and a lot of hiding and a lot of effort to never use the plates. Next question, why did the LDS church leadership hide and mislead its members and investigators for over a century about Joseph Smith's use of a peepstone, his treasure digging, and his use of a peepstone and a hat for the translation of the Book of Mormon. Why did they hide it? What were they concerned about? What's there to hide? It's a good question. What's weird about this? And next, something that's near and dear to my heart. Why did we learn the truth about the seer stone in the Book of Mormon from South Park, a cartoon on Comedy Central, before we learned about it from our sustained prophets, seers, and revelators? Why did we learn this from South Park? Last question. If LDS church leaders all carry the seer title, why do these prophets seers and revelators no longer use a peepstone. They're seers. The Book of Mormon tells us what it means to be a seer. Why aren't they using their seer stones to give us revelation? When's the hurricane coming? How do we stop COVID-19? Where should we invest our funds? Uh-oh, the internet's coming. These are all pretty good uses of a seer stone if you're a seer. So that's our presentation today. I hope you've enjoyed it.
to, this is my best explanation as to why Joseph Smith used a seer stone to translate the Book of Mormon. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Dr. John DeLynn. This is Understanding Mormonism. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Please share this video with as many people as possible. Please share with us your comments and experiences in the comments below here on YouTube or on Facebook. Please email us at understandmormonism at gmail.com. Not understanding Mormonism. Understand Mormonism at gmail.com. And if you want to help us prepare future episodes, future scripts, future topics, future PowerPoints, please email us your research at understandmormonism at gmail.com. Thanks everybody. This has been a pleasure. Hope to see you all real soon on Understanding Mormonism. Take care everybody.